for Sammy chapter 14. And again, all of our guests, we welcome you. We hope you're blessed today. For Sammy chapter 14, we have been on a series on, on courage. We've been dealing with the subject of courage. And um, this is going to be in tandem with that. We need to have courage to do what God wants us to do in life. First Samuel chapter 14, I want to start reading at verse number 6. The Bible says, And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come, and let us go over into the garrison of these uncircumcised. Notice these, these three words that he said. Sometimes we think that people of faith are people of absolute 100% certainty. The truth of the matter is, some of the things that we're going into... We don't know what life is going to bring or what life is going to throw at us. We approach it with faith, but we don't know how things are always going to turn out. Listen to what Jonathan said. He was a great man of faith, but listen to what he said. He said, we're going to go into the camp, this garrison of these uncircumcised. And he said, it may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. He's moving into a challenge in life that he's, he, he doesn't know how it's going to turn out. He's saying, you know what? God could help us with this. We don't always know. He, we know he's certainly able, he said. There's no restraint to the Lord to say by many or few, but it may be that the Lord will work for us. And in times of uncertainty, I'll tell you, the greatest thing that you can have is a friend. In times of uncertainty, the greatest thing that you can have is a godly friend that will be in your corner and say, I'm with you in whatever it is that you're doing. That's exactly what happened. His armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart. Do everything that's in your heart. Turn thee. Behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. And then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. If they say thus unto us, Tarry until we come to you, and we will stand still in our place, and will not go up unto them. But if they say thus, Come up unto us, then we will go up, for the Lord hath delivered them into our hand, and this shall be a sign unto us. And both of them discovered themselves under the garrison of the Philistines, and the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they have hid themselves. And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us, and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet, and his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer slew after him. And that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within, as it were, an half acre of land which a yoke of oxen might plow. God gave him a great victory, but he didn't get that victory by himself. Jonathan, even though he's a special guy, realizes that he, he needed a compatriot. He needed someone that was going to be with him in the battle. And I want to preach from the subject of courage, but I want to add a prefix to that word. And I want to add the prefix E-N. And I want to preach this morning, N, courage. N, courage. Would you put your Bible down, lift your hands to the Lord, and let's talk to God for a minute here, and let's ask God to bless us. Let's ask God to bless His word to our hearts. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, Lord, we look to you. Hallelujah. We're asking you to speak to us. We're asking you, O oh God. Hallelujah, through this vehicle that you've chosen, the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God, I pray you would bring encouragement. I pray that you would bring life. I pray that you would talk to us today out of the Scripture. I pray let something be said today that would personalize and touch a heart and give someone strength, Lord, for what lies ahead and where they're at in life now. I pray these things in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. God bless you. You can be seated today. Courage is also called bravery or valor. And courage is the choice and willingness to confront agony, pain, danger, uncertainty, or intimidation. It is the quality of mind or spirit that enables a person to face difficulty, to face the dangers of life, to face the challenges of life. I think possibly many of us may have some wrong, very wrong ideas about courage. Some of us may think that when you deal with the idea of having courage, that that means you're never scared. The truth of the matter is that that's not the case. Sometimes courage means that while you're facing the greatest thing that you could ever fear in life, in spite of that, 
You don't let it debilitate you. You don't let it stop you. But you move forward even facing what it is that you fear. And you move, move forward with fortitude. And you move forward with the mindset that says, even though I'm scared right now, I know God can help me. I know the Lord can help me. Courage does not mean that you have no fear. It means that you act in spite of the fear that you have. In other words, you consider the fear, you consider the challenge and the adversity that's in front of you, and in spite of it, you still act even though you're afraid. Courage is facing your fears. And I would say today that courage is incredibly vital to every one of us because the most spiritual among us, we're still human beings. We're still people. We still have our own foibles and faults and issues in life, but but in spite of all that, we still say we're going to move forward in what God has for our life. So because of that, I would say that courage is one of the most important, one of the most important things that we can have in our life if we're going to move forward in the will of God for our life. I mean, you may be here making a consideration about Christianity. You may be here this morning wondering about all this. Is there a God? Is this God real? You may feel something tugging on your heart, pressing you and pushing you into some place you've never been. And I'm telling you what you need in that kind of circumstance is the courage that says, I'm going to move forward in whatever God is leading me into. Even though it may be a little bit scary. I mean, it, it takes courage to bow your knees for the first time and pray a prayer to the Lord. It takes courage. It takes courage to be a Christian. It takes courage to repent of your sins and to walk away from an old life. And so you may be here and it's like God is dealing with you and you realize that there are changes that have to be made if you're going to walk with God. And I, I remember when I first started coming to church, and first of all, I think we ought to celebrate every guest that's here today because they came to a Pentecostal church in spite of all that they'd heard. Uh-huh. They heard about how crazy... You people are and how you worship and you might run around the church and you get loud and, you know, you, they've seen that every place else. They've never seen that in church. And in spite of all of that, they heard you people speak in other tongues. And in spite of all that, they came to church. I'm telling you, that takes some courage. That takes some courage. And when the Lord started dealing with me, I started, I kind of ran, ran away from church for a little while because I was, I was freaked out and I knew God was real. And all of a sudden God started dealing with me and it kind of scared me. It freaked me out. And I thought, man, if, if you know, I'm going to come to God and I'm going to live like these people live, there's a lot of stuff in my life that isn't right. And, and, and I don't think that I can stop doing the things that I'm doing to be a Christian. I don't think I can, I can live the way that these people live. And I'm telling you, it takes a lot of courage for a person to bend their knees before the Lord and say, I repent of all my sins. Come on, congregation. Am I in the right church here this morning? Anybody real here today? You ever been there? It takes a lot of courage to make that decision. It takes a lot of courage to be baptized in Jesus' name. You say, well, I don't see how that takes a whole lot of courage. I tell you what, I know a lot of people that get baptized that are afraid of the water. My grandfather was baptized in his 60s. I think he was 65 or 66 years old when he got baptized. And what I didn't know is my grandfather was afraid of the water. He spent his whole life being afraid of the water. And for him to go into that baptismal tank and to be pushed underwater, and I think this is a good time for a disclaimer that when we baptize people, we put them under the water, but we pick them back up. Right? Right? We, we pick people back up after, after they go down in the water. That may, some people, we may need to hold them down one or two seconds longer, maybe. Some of you, we need to hold down a second. But it takes a lot of courage. That's why sometimes we start talking about this stuff. We'll walk somebody back there and show them the baptismal take and show them how it works. What are you saying? I'm just saying that living for God takes courage sometimes. It takes courage to stand for righteousness. It takes courage to say, I'm going to live for God. It takes courage to be different than the world and the society that you live in. It takes courage to square your shoulders and say, I'm going to be a child of God, and I'm going to be what God wants me to be. 
And you may face a lot of adversity in life, but it takes courage to be able to stand and say, I'm going to live for God. It takes courage to overcome shyness. I don't think, are we live this morning? We're live this morning. So Brianne's probably listening or watching. I try not to talk about my kids too much, but my daughter Brianne, I've got four children, and they all have very differing personalities. Um, They're all aggressive. They get that from their mother. They're all strong-willed. They get that from her too. But Brianne is our is one of our. She's our she's our melancholy in the family. She's very sensitive, and she's um, you know she's a sensitive person, and um, she's very bright, very intelligent. Brianne, if you're watching, I'm bragging about you right now. But at the same time, she's 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 shy, and so I mean, her and her sister shared the womb together. They shared mama's belly together. And literally in 18 years of time, they never spent more than one day apart. 18 years. And all of a sudden, the Lord begins to start dealing with her and stirring her to look at going to college. And she looks at going to a college that's hundreds of miles away. She doesn't have her twin with her. She doesn't know anybody there hardly. She goes into a very you know uncertain environment, very different place. And I'm telling you, to do something like that, you know what it takes? It takes courage. It takes courage to do something like that. It takes courage to not just hide out in your room, but get out of your room and go to what they call the slob. You know what the slob is? I had, somebody had to tell me this because they would talk about going to the slob. The slob is the student lobby. They have a slob and they have a blob. I mean, who, who, who thinks this stuff up? The blob is the business lobby, and the slob is the student lobby. And all the students hang out in the slob. It's the student lobby. So, so Brianne, it would be a lot easier for her to just hide out in her room, right? Just, she's a little melancholy. But it takes courage to get out of your room and socialize and connect with people. And let me tell you what, if it takes courage, it takes sometimes, you know, sometimes our courage is flagging and lacking a little bit. But aren't you thankful that you've got people in life that'll come alongside of you and build you up? That'll whisper in your ear, not that you can't do it, but they'll whisper in your ear, you can do it. That's what I come to preach about this morning and courage. It's annoying sometimes. My wife has got one of these devices, and this thing buzzes like all day long. And you moms know exactly what I'm talking about. You know what it buzzes all day long? It's texts from all four of the children. We're on date night. It's a Thursday night. And this, this phone is ringing and it's FaceTiming. It's awesome. It's awesome. And you know why they do that all the time? Because they know mom. You know what mom's going to do? Mom's going to encourage. Mom's like, it's going to be okay. And she texts his dad now and then. Because dad encourages now and then. But moms, they, they got this, this thing down. I'm talking this morning about courage. There may be people in this building here this morning that you're fighting depression. And nobody else knows it. And you put your best Sunday game face on. You showed up in the house of God. You put your praise on. And nobody may know what it took for you to get to the house of God today. And we commend you for making a right decision and coming to church in spite of how you feel saying, I'm going to worship God. Sometimes it takes courage to do that. We're living in a, in a culture today that is, that is ridden with anxiety. There are so many anxiety issues in our, in our culture today. And I realize in a, in, in a room like this, there, there are probably people that are facing, that have social anxieties. And it's like, man, it just took everything you had to come to church. I just, I am here to say, God bless you. You made a right decision to come to the house of God. You made a right decision to have the courage I mention our guests often, a guest to come into a place, a bunch of people they don't know, a religious experience they've never had. They don't know when they're supposed to stand or when they're supposed to sit. They're looking for the itinerary. How's all this supposed to work? And yet, in spite of that, they decided to come to church this morning. You know what that is? That is courage. That is courage. I'm saying there's seasons of life that maybe you're negotiating challenging situations in your own life. 
Maybe you're facing health issues and, and you've got health issues that are nagging on you and you're physically tired and, and facing challenges in life and yet you square your shoulders, you wake up with the sun in the morning and you say, you know what, I'm going to greet this day with love in my heart and I'm going to live for God and I'm going to do what God wants me to do. It takes courage to do all of those things. It takes courage to soldier on when you're short of breath. We got people in our church right now that are facing huge, huge uh, physical maladies in their life. And yet they keep on keeping on. I'll tell you what I say. Thank God for that. And I tell you the kind of voice that I want to be. I want to be the kind of voice that doesn't pull them down. I want to be the kind of voice that lifts them up. If you need courage, sometimes what you need to do to get courage is you need somebody that's around you that'll look at you and will and courage and courage. Now this, this month has been pastor appreciation month. I haven't had a chance to say anything about that. You guys kind of sprung that on me. I'm not complaining. I'm grateful. I'm thankful. And, um, I have gotten a boatload of cards. I mean, I commend this church. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very, very much. And I'll tell you what I've appreciated so much is so many of you have written cards out. And I, you know what I've done with them? They're in my office. I've got a shelf behind my desk, and all of them, I got a pile of them. I got a stack of them. I got a stack of them. I got some of them that are open. You know, I got them kind of, you know, propped up on, on that little shelf there. And now and then I pull them out and I read them. And you know what? Some of those, some of those cards say wonderful, kind things. And I just, I just, I want to thank God for this church. Sincere words of encouragement. It built, when you send words of encouragement to someone, it builds up the person that you are encouraging. Everybody say amen. I'm going to teach here for a little while this morning, all right? So here's what it looks like. We got Jenga and we got balloons, man. We got all kinds of stuff. My OCD is bugging me. Just give me a minute. Do you know what you know what life is like sometimes? Life is like living for God is like. It's like a balloon, right? And you add a little prayer to your life, and what happens? Add a little bit of word of God to your life, and what happens? You go to church. What happens? Right? Somebody writes you a card or sends you a text or makes a phone call. What happens? You come into the altars. Now, we got to define what does that mean. At the end of the service, normally we have a time where people can come up and pray. That's what the altars mean. The altars mean a time and a place that we come up together and we just kind of pray and seek the Lord, right? How many are thankful for altars in your life? I'm thankful for altars. Let me tell you what happens in the altar. In the altar, the presence of God will blow into your life. Somebody may come up next to you and put their hand on your shoulder and begin to pray a prayer over your life. They may say things, you're like, how in the world did they know what I was going through? They didn't know, but God knew. Right? And you're filled with encouragement. I'm really going to encourage you with this. Really what I'm going to do is I'm going to be real with us. I want to be real with us. Okay, so here's where we are, right? And then all of a sudden what happens? Monday comes around. And then Tuesday comes around. And then Wednesday comes around. And then Thursday comes around. You get the point, right? Do I got to keep doing this? And then Friday comes around, right? And then Saturday comes around. You're like, oh, God, it's church. Church is tomorrow. I need church. You know why? Because whatever God puts into our life, it begins to naturally dissipate in our life. Mm-hmm. That's why a one-time Holy Ghost infilling isn't enough. That's why a one-time visit to church isn't enough. Come on, I'm in the book here this morning. The Bible says the outward man perishes, 
but the inward man is renewed, how? Day by day. The inward man is renewed day by day. That means Monday rolls around and this starts happening to be, you go, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a word of prayer. I'm going to read a scripture. Somebody may send you a text or send you a word of encouragement. You, Bible studies, thank you very much. Right? What I'm saying is we need to continue to get filled up with the encouragement of God so that the good things that God puts into our life, they don't just disappear and fly away. We need God to continue to put courage in our life. And I thank God that we've got a good God that will continue to funnel into our life all of the resources that we need and everything that we need in our life. He'll continue to provide for us and fill us and give us what we need day after day after day. Do it this way, all right? What do you call this? Thank you. <laughs> Very bright class here this morning. This is a balloon, right? This is a helium filled balloon. That means there's a substance, I don't know how it works, but what is helium? It's just a special gas. Mike could probably be able to tell us all about it. Okay, it's special gas, right? That causes this thing to rise, right? This thing is, it just rises. It just rises, right? It just, I'm going to do what we don't want any of our kids to do. It just rises, right? That's just like living for God, man. I'll fly away, oh glory. Come on, loosen up a little bit. Right? And so we get filled, and, 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 and God fills us, and God blesses us, and God lifts us, and, and you know, we're encouraged. And, but here, here's what I want you to notice. This, this is the important part. Dave, don't, don't, where's Dave at? Where's Dave Hall? Don't freak out. It's okay, bro. Dave's like, how am I going to get it down? What am I going to do? He'll be here tonight with a BB gun or something. <laughs> you know what, though? You don't have to worry about that, Dave, because you give that a day or two days or three days or four, and all I'm asking this congregation to do is pay attention to that balloon. When you come in next Sunday, I'm not going to do anything with it. I'm going to leave it. I want you to come in next Sunday and I want you to look around for that balloon. I'm going to guess, and again, Mike would probably know better than this with the gases. I don't know how it works. I don't know if, if it leaks out, you know, if the membrane gets looser and it leaks out of that or what happens or it dissipates. But you know what's going to happen? That balloon is not going to be on the ceiling next Sunday. You know why? Because what's inside of it begins to just naturally dissipate out of it. Right? Right? I fully believe that the world that we are living in today, that people are walking around like a thirsty man that's in the middle of a barren desert. And it's like they haven't had a drink in like, you know, three days. And they're, Ugh, I just, I just got to get a drink. I got to get a drink. And they're parched and they're thirsty and they're looking for just a good word from somewhere. But I'm so thankful that we've got a God that will input into our lives, that will fulfill the thirst that we have in our soul. When our soul is empty and we're thirsty, the Bible says, whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. We've got a God that will fulfill our parched, thirsty soul and will give us exactly what we need in our life. He will give us the strength that we need and he'll give us the encouragement that we need. I'm going to tell you the other thing that God will do is that there are times that God will send somebody by your way that will, that will come alongside of you. And you ought to recognize and thank God for it. Somebody that will come alongside of you that will be and encouragement because sometimes we need a little help from others that's the truth we need a little help from others so let's go to our scripture Samuel 14 and 6 this guy's name is Jonathan Jonathan is a king's kid right he is King Saul's son he's a special guy he's a king's kid something is stirring within him he wants to do something it's time that the people of God win a victory 
And it says, Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over into the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. I want to remind everybody here this morning that this, this walk with God is a walk of faith. It is a, and you know what faith? Faith involves risk. If you're ever going to do anything significant for God, you have no absolute 100% guarantee that it's always going to work out the way that you think it's going to work out. And what I would say is in this walk of faith, that is exactly the time when we don't have a 100% guarantee. We're not, we're not absolutely certain. I would say that that is the point in time that we need somebody that will come alongside of us. Somebody that will come along inside and say, guess what? I'm with you. Verse 7 said, His armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. Could it be that those four simple words could be the difference between victory and defeat in somebody's life? If somebody would just whisper at the appropriate time, I'm with you. You're not alone in this thing. You're not by yourself. I want you to know that, I, that, I'm, that I'm with thee. The Bible says in verse number 12, the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we'll show you a thing. And Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, come up after me for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. There was a garrison of the Philistines that was on the top of this mountain. A garrison. Now, we don't know how big a garrison it is. I, I can't venture to guess. I don't know exactly how big it is. All I know is that when Jonathan and his armor bearer, they won the battle, we know that they, they took out, they slaughtered 20 men, right? So we don't know if a garrison is 20. We don't know if they took out the whole garrison. We know a garrison was at least 20. Possibly it was more than that. So let's just say it was 20. So there were 20 in the garrison, right? And there's Jonathan the armor, armor bearer. Jonathan the armor bearer. So we have two against 20. Two against 20, those are not the best of odds. Two against 20, what does that mean? That's 10 to 1 odds. What's that mean? That means the likelihood is you're going to get your head kicked in. That means the likelihood is you're going to get your teeth kicked down your throat. Sometimes the odds are stacked against us. Come on. Sometimes the diagnosis, the doctor says, you know, this is impossible. Sometimes the diagnosis of life, you look at it and everything seems absolutely impossible. And what I would, I would vouch for this morning is that's the exact time that you need somebody that's going to come in next to you and say, guess what? I'm going to be your armor bearer. The odds are against you. You got 10 to 1 odds against you. But, and you got a lot that's against you. But even though that you got a lot that's against you, I want you to know that you've got somebody that's for you. There's plenty of critics in this world. There's plenty of cynics in this world. There's plenty of people that will tell you it can't be done. But thank God that God sometimes will bring somebody right alongside of us uh, that will put their arm around our shoulder and say, though the odds may be against you, I want you to know that I'm going to be in your corner. And though everything may be stacked against you, I want you to know that I'm going to be with you. That's called N, courage. That's not the time you need somebody to get up in your ear and say, yeah, you're probably going to die. <laughs> There's some people, the only way they, br they brighten a room is by leaving it. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know about you, I don't want to be that kind of person. The only way they could say less is talk more. You know what I'm talking about? I don't want to be that kind of person. Watch, verse 13. And Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet and his armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer slew after him. What are you saying, pastor? I'm saying Jonathan's armor bearer supported him. Jonathan's armor bearer walked into the most, one of the most difficult points in his life and walked into the challenge with him. We need the kind of people that when the going gets tough, they don't get to walking out. But when the going gets tough, they say, I'm going to hang tight with you. And whatever you're going through, you're not going to go through it alone. Come on, church. That's the kind of church God wants us to be. We're not the kind of church that walks out when the going gets tough. We're not going to be the kind of church that comes alongside of people and say, oh, I guess you're just going to go to hell. 
I guess you're just going to lose out. No, we're not that kind of church. We're the kind of church that says that if God be for us, who can be against us? Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. If God brought you to it, he's going to bring you through it. If you're facing the adversity and the difficulty, guess what? We've got a God that can perform the miraculous. Uh, and though you may feel like everything's stacked against you, uh, I want you to know that I'm with you. And I want you to know that God's with you. Yeah. Hallelujah. And courage. We got a cool thing we're doing in our conference room. We're putting that all together. It's coming together really nice. We have all kinds of teaching and training and stuff that happens, meetings that happen in that room. And... Um, we bought a bunch of letters. They're wooden letters. My understanding is those wooden letters got painted. There's a bunch of them. There's a whole slew of them. You put all those, those painted letters together and you put them on the wall. We've got a saying that's going on the wall of our conference room. And it's a saying that is dear to the heart of River of Life. It's a wonderful saying. It's a beautiful saying. It's a powerful saying. It's a saying that you can build a church on. You know what that saying is? The saying is teamwork makes the dream work. You know what that means? United we stand, divided we fall. If we don't stand together, we don't stand at all. But we're in a church that stands together. We're in a church uh, that says if you're going through tumult and trial and tribulation and adversity and difficulty, we're not the kind of church that goes running out in that circumstance. We're the kind of church that's going to come right up next to you and say you're not alone in the battle, but we're with you and God's with you and God's going to help you through this problem that you're going through. Because you need courage. When you're facing great challenges in life, and courage is something that we can give to one another. It's called N, courage. I'm going to preach a, or talk about a scripture I love so much in the Bible. Hebrews 10.23, we use it all the time, right? Hebrews 10.23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Look at the person sitting next to you and say, don't ever let go. Don't ever let go. Don't ever let go. Look at them and say, get a grip. Get a grip. Hold fast. Hold fast. That's what he said. Get a grip. You're enjoying that too much. Get a grip. Hold fast the profession of your faith. In other words, once God's done a work in your life, listen, don't ever let go of it. Don't ever let go of the work of God in your life. Don't ever let go of your salvation. I don't have time to teach on this subject, but the Bible does not teach unconditional eternal security. It don't teach that. It says, whosoever will let, him drink of, will, let him drink of the water of life freely. God does not predispose certain people to salvation and certain people to damnation. That would be unfair, that would be cruel, and that would be vindictive. God's not like that. God doesn't say, oh, well, you're going to hell no matter what you do. Come on, we ought to be thankful for that. Everybody, God wants everybody to be saved. That's why I'm preaching here this morning. That's why we reach into our community. God wants everybody in Grand Rapids to experience the miracle, might, and power of biblical salvation. God wants everybody to be saved. And we're reaching for everybody to be saved. Everybody to be saved. Everybody. God wants everybody to get the Holy Ghost. That's why he died on Calvary. He died on the cross because he's not willing. He's not willing. It's not God's will. He's not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. God wants everybody to repent. That's good news. God wants everybody to be saved. What that means is you've got to believe. You've got to follow the scripture. You've got to say, okay, salvation's for me. I want it. And that's fundamentally what happened when you came to salvation. You said, man, I, I believe the word of God. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe that his blood was for me. I believe it so much that I'm repenting of my sins. I believe the gospel so much that I am delighted by the opportunity to be water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of my sins. I'm delighted by that opportunity. I've never seen anybody come out of the tank and say, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. Never seen anybody get the Holy Ghost and, and be filled with the Spirit and speak in other tongues and go, oh man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. It's the greatest thing that ever, can ever happen to you. And what I'm saying is when, when you partner your will, 
your belief. Okay, God, that's what you want from my life. That's what I want. Then I have to hold fast to that because everything in the world now wants to steal the greatest gift you have in your life. The devil wants to steal your salvation. The world wants to take your salvation. I'm preaching really good this morning. Your flesh, if you're not careful, wants to take away or lead you in a way away from God. That's why you say, no, 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 no. I'm getting a grip on this thing. I don't care what I got to go through in life. I don't care how hard it gets. I don't care the problems I got to face. I made up my mind with the help of Almighty God. I'm going to make heaven my home. I'm going to walk on streets of gold. I'm going to see Jesus one day. I'm not ever going to give up on God. I'm not ever going to give up. That's what the writer's saying. Hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Watch 24. Let us consider one another to provoke. You're like, man, I like that. Provoke. And all the brothers are happy about their younger sisters now. They've been given permission. Provoke. Not that kind of provoke. This is good provoking. Provoke unto love and the good works. What does that mean? We're encouraging one another. Come on, do the right thing. God's going to bless you. He, God's going to bless your life. Keep doing it. Keep loving God. Keep loving people. Keep loving the church. Keep loving the church. Keep loving truth. Keep loving holiness. Keep loving righteousness. Provoke unto love and the good works. Keep doing the right thing. Because all kinds of voices are telling you to do the wrong thing. That's why when we come to church, we got to be provoking one another. Come on, keep doing the right thing. Come on. When the honeymoon wears off and you've been in church now for, you know, now you're in church two years and the honeymoon is off. What does that mean? Come on now. That means when the work starts kicking in and all of a sudden the devil's doubling down on you, right? And all of a sudden it's not, it's not the newness anymore. Now you got the rhythm. You're coming to church Sunday morning, Sunday night. You're coming to PM Live. You're coming to Wednesday night life groups. And that's, that's what mature saints of God do. <laughs> I love this job. That's what mature saints of God do, right? And everything is angling for you like, hey, man, just let up a little bit. Hey, don't, no. Hey, just relax. You know what I mean? Everything's angling for you. That's why we provoke one another to love and to good works. Come on. Come on. Keep on keeping on. Keep living for God. You've been living for God for a decade. Wonderful. Living for God two decades. Wonderful. Keep living for God. And then the zinger. Paul was a good pastor. And then he goes, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. Keep going to church. Not forsaking is the matter of some is. He's like, there's going to be people, and there's always going to be people in the church that lay out a church. There's just going to be people when church is going on, they're going to be watching the football game. There's, a, there's always going to be a contingency of people that when, I mean, it is amazing to me that we'll have a couple hundred people on a Sunday morning, we'll have a, you know, a hundred and something on a Sunday night. Okay. Doesn't shock me. It's Paul said it. He said, don't lay out a church. That's what some people do, right? But he said, this is what you should do. He said, but exhort one another. Not a cool word, exhort. I exhort thee today. When you start using this terminology, right? I exhort you. Talk to your kids like that. I exhort you to clean your room. I exhort you to take out the garbage. We don't use that word, right? But it's a Bible word. What does it mean? Inherent in the word exhort it literally, in the original language, it has the connotation of inspiring, to inspire. It means to reassure. It means to strengthen. He said, exhort one another, inspire one another. He's saying, reassure one another, implore each other, urge one another. You get it? It's kind of like my whole message that I'm preaching here this morning. Encourage, encourage, assure one another. So we come to church. We don't do like some people in the of church. We go to church, we worship God. But when we go to church, part of what we do, the Bible says is we inspire one another. We encourage one another. So not only do we come, we worship God, but we're looking around at the body of Christ, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we're looking for opportunities that we can reassure someone. So it's time in the altar, and we're looking around. Man, is there someone struggling in church? Is there someone that's going through a trial? Are they going through financial duress? Are they going through a adversity in their life? I'm looking around because the Bible says that when we gather together, we are exhorting one another. 
we're encouraging one another. That means we may kind of come up in an altar service and put our arm around somebody's shoulder and, and whisper a word of encouragement in their ear or pray for them, pray a prayer. He's saying it's so important because one thing that we've got to have in our life is we've got to have courage. But if we're going to have courage, we need to be the kind of people that are encouraging one another. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's one of the greatest assets that we have in our walk with God. So church is a pep rally for believers. I don't know about that. Church is a way that we encourage one another. So, brother Lon, <laughs> uh, it takes a manly man. That's all I'm saying. Matches your tie, like, perfectly. We couldn't have planned that any better. I know some of the stuff we say sometimes, like, we're not here to cheerlead people. All right, Ron, you want to grab that? I need some help. Who else? Logan, take that one. Alex, come on, man, he's a musician. Good snag. So, give me a J. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, what are you saying, though? Sometimes, if we're sensitive, if you look around, there are people that are facing challenges around here. Now, there's, gonna, there's a lot of people, and you're like, that's not me. I, everything's great in my life right, right now. Well, thank God for that. If you're not facing a mega challenge, thank God for that. And I don't know what the percentages are. Maybe it's 50, 50, 60, 40, 70, 30. I have no idea. But may, so there's probably a contingency to have great victory in life. Everything's going well. What does the Bible say? It says rejoice with them that rejoice. So we're not going to be like, oh, they're happy. I need to pull them down to my level. Can't believe they're happy. I'm not having a good week, so I hope they have a terrible week like me. No, we don't do that. Oh, they got blessed. They, they bought a brand new car. Oh, I hope they crash. They got a brand new house. Hope it blows up. No, we don't do that, right? We rejoice with them that rejoice. Thank God. God's blessed you. God's blessed you. <laughs> You're doing good, man. It's natural. You just, it's just... <laughs> but then we weep with them that weep. What does that mean? There may be someone that just came to the house of God and they lost a loved one. They're going through personal difficulty like you can't even imagine in their life. And most of us, we don't wear our feelings on our sleeves. We don't, you know, we don't come crawling in and expect everybody to feel sorry for us. But the truth is, whatever the percentage is, there's somebody in church right now that's hurting. There's somebody in church right now that's going through a difficulty in their life. And you know what they need? They need somebody to come alongside of them and say, hey, listen, it's going to be all right. You're facing sickness right now, but hey, it's going to be all right. You've got a God that's on your side. His grace is sufficient. You're not in this thing by yourself. Come on, you may be weeping, but weeping may endure for a night, but joy is going to come in the morning. It's going to get better. And we encourage one another. Where's our little kazoo things going on? Come on, blow those things. <laughs> that was weak, man. I'm sorry I didn't give you much to work with. We could ask Sister Pat to whistle. That freak everybody out. She's got a shrill whistle. <laughs> Powerful. <laughs> you know what? We need to get used to doing that, though. I'm not saying that's the only way. We'll, we'll talk about some practical things here before we wrap up. Okay, we encourage one another. I thank God. If courage is important for us to go the next mile, 
then one of the greatest gifts that I could offer as a child of God is encourage. I want to encourage. Okay? So let's go as we go quickly. If you're taking notes, encouragement is not flattery. Okay? We okay with that? Encouragement is not flattery. Some people don't encourage. They're like, I'm not going to be some flattering. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be like, oh, that's cool. Encouragement is not cheap flattery. So how do you encourage? Number one, if you're going to encourage, you love the person you are encouraging. You genuinely care for them. They're your brother in Christ. They're your sister in Christ. They're in the family of God. And you genuinely love that person. Now, encouragement, when we talk about encouragement, encouragement is something that you give, okay? This is the funny thing about encouragement. Listen, encouragement doesn't cost you anything. It's not like a buck a word, right? It's not like 10 bucks a word. Oh, God bless you. That cost me 30 bucks, 10 bucks a word, right? Encouragement doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't cost anything to come up alongside somebody and just be kind. It doesn't, that's the beautiful thing. When you give encouragement to someone, it doesn't take anything from me. I don't lose. As a matter of fact, I gain. I've been in Proverbs a lot lately, and this morning I was going through it again. And it's, it's unique. The proverb writer talks about there's, there is one that gives a bunch away, and yet they always have a bunch. And there's the person, basically, the proverb writer says that hoards, and they have nothing. So it's it's a principle. It's like a boomerang. And you know what the boomerang principle is? It's the boomerang of blessing. That when you throw out blessing, it's it's uh, it's like Solomon that wrote when he said, you cast your bread upon the waters, and then it comes back to you. That's the way blessing works. So the beauty is when you when you give encouragement, it doesn't take anything from me. It's a gift. I mean, what do words cost? Do words cost that much? And again, I'm not talking about flattery. I'm not talking about cheap, stupid words. You know what I'm saying? But genuinely coming alongside of somebody and say, I just want you to know I'm with you. I know this has been a tough week for you, but I want you to know I'm praying for you. I want you to know I'm in your corner. I want you to know God is going to help you through this situation. What does that cost me? It doesn't cost me anything. But what a difference it could make to the person that I give those words to freely. What a difference that it can make in their life. I'm willing to give those words away. Give those words away. Okay? So give the encouragement away. It's a gift. Make sure the encouragement is true and sincere and from the heart. It's not fluff. It's genuine. It's real. It's from the heart. Give that kind of encouragement away. Be creative. Think about how could I I encourage this person? What What a culture. That's a powerful culture. How can I? Maybe it's sending a text. Again, text used to cost you something. It doesn't cost you anything now. You can send as many texts you want. Now. Doesn't, doesn't cost a text. Write a card. You know, make a phone call. Send a, a pigeon. I mean, you know what I'm saying? There's all different kind of ways. Be creative. Be creative. Okay, this is the one I want to I major on because it's so simple. Speak it. Speak it. My, my father told me that I think he was... He, I think he was in his 40s or his 50s before he ever heard his dad say for the first time, son, I love you. Never, never heard his dad say that. And the boys, the four boys, they, they got to an age as they, they got older that they just they would say that to dad. Love you, dad. Love you. And then dad started saying back to them, I love you. Well, and I'm not saying that to critique or criticize my grandfather. He was raised in a home and his father never said, I love you. So he was just replicating all that he knew. It, but he learned that. What I'm saying is it doesn't cost anything. And, and importantly, say what you need to say. Speak what you need to speak. I, t- I tell you the thing, here's the deal. I've done a, a ton of funerals in my time as a pastor, and here's what I found to be so sad about funerals. What is so sad about funerals is everything that gets spoken at the funeral should have been said before the funeral. We need to have, like, pre-funeral. You know what I mean? Like, that's why we do heart of a servant. You know why we do that? We do heart of a servant because... Man, why not just celebrate and thank God for what he's done? Why wait until somebody dies and they can't hear you? Right? Speak it. Proverbs 18 and 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Right here. This little member right here, it can speak death or it can speak life. I'm so glad to be in a good church with good people, godly people, that want to speak, speak life. You speak life. You can speak encouragement to someone. You could be the thing that makes the difference in their life. 
Just a word fitly spoken, a right word could make a difference in somebody's life. That's why Paul wrote Colossians 4 and 6. He said, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer every man. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. In other words, what I say, I want to be careful that what I say, it is filled with grace. What is grace? Don't have time for the Bible study. It's the power to do the will of God. It's the desire to do the will of God. Literally, he's saying, I can season my words in such a way that what I speak gives people a greater desire to live for God. It gives them power in their life. It empowers them to live for God. I can speak words that tear down, or I can speak words that are uplifting, words that exhort, and words that edify, and words that build grace into somebody's life. I can speak words of encouragement in somebody's life. And literally make a difference for them. Last point that I'll make related to this is encourage during a difficult time. If you know someone is going through a sickness, they're going through, you know, a personal loss or death in their family. Maybe there's a huge responsibility that they're carrying. Maybe they're walking into a new job opportunity there. Maybe they're under heavy levels of stress and duress. That is a great time for us to be highly sensitive to where that person is at in life and to be able to bring a word of encouragement to them. The Bible says in Galatians 6 and 2, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So somebody's going through a difficult time. We can come alongside of them. We can't take it away because what they're going through, they, we, we can't take away the pain of it. But I tell you what we can do. We can carry a little bit of it with them. We can come alongside of them and say, I know you've lost a loved one this week, but I want you to know that I'm praying with you. I want you to know I'm standing with you. God is going to sustain you during this time. And those tears that you're crying, we're going to be crying those tears along with you. And we can encourage someone in a difficult time of life, and it can make the difference in someone's life and give them the courage to go on by encouraging them. I'm going to close with this, this thought and this idea. There are two prefixes that can be used when it comes to the word courage. You can put dis in front of the word courage. Dis. Courage. The devil, according to legend, once advertised his tools for sale at a public auction. When the prospective buyers assembled, there was one oddly shaped tool which was labeled not for sale. When asked to explain why this was, the devil explained, and he said, I can spare my other tools, but I cannot spare this one. It is the most useful implement I have. It is called discouragement. And with it, I can work my way into hearts otherwise inaccessible. When I get this tool into a man's heart, the way is open to plant anything there that I desire. Discouragement. You know, in seasons of discouragement, you've got to be careful. Because in seasons of discouragement, it's easy to throw in the towel. In seasons of discouragement, it's, it's possible to make permanent decisions over temporary problems. I've seen people make permanent decisions over temporary situations. It's like, man, please don't blow up your life right now. Come on, don't blow up your life over temporary problem that you're going through right now because discouragement can do that. I don't know about you, but I don't ever want to be that kind of a person. I don't want to be the kind of person that speaks discouragement into other people's life. I don't want to be a cynic. I don't want to be a critic. I don't want to be negative. I don't want to be the kind of person that says, oh, you, I don't think you can do it negative. I don't want to be that kind of person. I, I want to be an encouraging person. I don't want it to be a discouraging kind of a person. Right? So, here is courage. I can discourage. Or I can encourage. We're all given the tool. Courage is there. I can be this person. Or I can be this person. I believe I'm in a church that wants to be this kind of people. You know what this is? This is kind words. I'm going to get it. Come on, encourage me. Just kidding. It lends a helping hand to those that are hurting. It lends a prayer to those that are challenged. Encourage says you can do it. 
and courage says, God's going to help you. So the question is, which prefix will we own? <laughs> We're going to end courage. Stand together with me this morning. And courage says, I can do all things through Christ. And courage says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Courage builds churches. Courage builds saints. Courage builds families. And sometimes, wherever we're at, it takes courage to take the next step in life. There's some of you that may be a place in your walk with God right now where you're, you're just learning, you're growing. Maybe you're in some formative stages of your walk with God and you're making alterations and you're, and you're making changes. And there may be even be people in your life that are like, man, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? And you're adapting new things into your life and you're adopting new habits into your life and you're jettisoning old habits. And all the church said amen. It's part, it's part of living for God, isn't it? And man, that can be such a trying time of life. What the church rises to its feet to say today is you can do it. You can be what God wants you to be. Maybe there are changes that you're making in your life, and you're like, man, these are, this is freaky. I've never, I've never been here before. The church rises to its feet and says, you can do it. You can do it. You can live for God. You can be what God wants you to be. If you're facing depression in your life, and you just feel like and the devil is a liar, I hate the spirit of suicide that is rampaging through our culture today. The spirit of suicide will say, the attitude of suicide will say, you're in a dark place. Your family was like this. You're always going to be like this. It's always going to be like this. It's never going to get any better. But I tell you, that's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says you're going to get better. The Word of God says the Lord's going to lift you. And that's what we give voice to, the courage that is so desperately needed to do what God wants us to do and to become what God wants us to become. We as the church echo the voice of Christ when we say, you can do it. You can do it. You can put God first in your life. You can be everything that God wants you to be. I passed it long enough to recognize that there are people in the church, there are probably someone here this morning that's wrestling with addiction in their life. But I tell you what we don't do in the church, what we don't do is go tisk tisk and point our bony finger of accusation against them and say, you're never going to be anything different than what you've always been. That's not, that's not how we communicate. What we say is, God's going to help you with that. God's got better for your life than that. God doesn't want you to be an addict forever. Come on, the Holy Ghost that God put into your life will cause you to rise. You're going to write, you, you, you may not be there yet, but don't ever give up. Dave Hall was in the church filled with the Holy Ghost, struggled with nicotine for a year probably. I bring him up now and then. Struggled for a year. And he tried patches and he tried this and he tried that. But you know what? Dave Hall is, is smoke free. He's saving himself hundreds of dollars a month. His lungs are in better shape. Even the color of his skin is better. But he kept going after it. He kept going after it. I know some people have said, man, it was easier to quit methamphetamine than it was to stop smoking. I know people have said that. So what are we going to say? If somebody struggles with smoking, you know what we're going to say? Come on, God's going to come on. I'm going to pray with you about that. I'm going to pray with you about that. We're going to bear one another's burden. I, I'll tell you what, I'll fast this week with you about that. I'm going to help you. Come on, church. That's the kind of church that we're going to be. Encourage. You can do it. You can make it.